Today we'll see the first video in a series on gases, on the gas laws. If you've taken another chemistry class or a physics class, you've probably seen some of this material before, but it's an important part of chemistry and it's actually fairly easy. The, the math involved is not real complicated and it should be a kind of a break from all the intensive stoichiometry and those sorts of things. We'll start out by reviewing a few quantitative facts about gases. One of the facts about gases that makes this actually a useful study is that the physical properties for gases are about the same for all gases, no matter what their chemical properties are. So if you have something that's very reactive gas or an unreactive gas, for most circumstances that we encounter in ordinary life, they're going to behave exactly the same way. So we can learn one set of rules that apply to all gases, and that makes it kind of nice. Another quantitative fact is that gases expand to fill their container. And so the volume of any gas is equal to the size of the container that it's in at the current time. There are four quantities that you really need to be able to keep track of if you're going to understand a sample of a gas completely. And one of them is pressure. So we're going to take a look at pressure and then start to see how it relates to the other quantities, which are volume, temperature, and quantity. First, we're going to define pressure. Pressure is the ratio of force applied to area that it's applied over. So symbolically, that's force over area, F over A, F divided by A. Now, what are the SI units? If you think about this SI unit of force, it's the, it's the Newton. A Newton is the force it takes to make one kilogram of mass go a meter per second faster every second. So that's what a Newton is in basic units. It's a kilogram meter per second squared. So that's the SI unit of force. And the SI unit of area, the standard unit of area, would be a meter by a meter, so a meter squared. So those are the SI units, newtons per square meter. This has been renamed, so you don't have to write newtons per square meter, the Pascal, which is abbreviated PA. Pascal turns out to be a fairly small unit of pressure, and most of the time we're going to use something else. One of the most common places that we experience the pressure of a gas is atmospheric pressure. The air molecules that surround the Earth are pulled on by a gravitational pull just like you are. So here's the Earth, here's you standing on the Earth, but you are surrounded by this layer of air molecules. And all those air molecules, every one of them, is under a gravitational pull towards the center of the Earth. Because they're all being pulled towards the center of the Earth, they exert a pressure on the Earth. And, and just like if you have a garbage bag and you poured water into it, it would at first only exert pressure on the floor but then it would begin to exert pressure on the walls of the garbage bag as it filled up. And the same thing is happening for air molecules. Because they're not only impacting the Earth, but they're also impacting all the other things that are on the Earth and the other air molecules that are around them, this pressure is equally pushing everywhere, up, down, to the side. That's called atmospheric pressure. So it's due to gravitational attraction for all the air molecules towards the center of the Earth. If you get far enough away from the Earth, that pull is not strong, and there aren't that many air molecules pulled in there. So you climb to a high mountain or go up high in an aircraft or a weather balloon, it starts to get hard to breathe because there just isn't that much air there anymore. A guy named Evangelista Torricelli decided it would be a good idea to be able to measure this because he wanted to find out if atmospheric pressure was changing from time to time or if it was something that was constant. So he invented a thing called a barometer. Meter always means measure in science words, and bar means pressure, specifically atmospheric pressure. So this is a pressure measurer. Now here's how it works. He takes a long skinny tube, kind of like a uh, test tube almost, and fills it completely up with mercury. So this thing is completely filled with mercury. He chose mercury because mercury is pretty heavy and it's also a liquid, so it will behave the way he wants it to. He puts his thumb over the top, seals it off, flips the thing upside down, and then he has a bowl of mercury sitting there and he inserts it in that bowl of mercury so that the opening is under the fluid level, and then takes his thumb away. Now here's what happens. Because mercury is so heavy, it starts to sink down into this bowl of mercury. And that leaves a vacuum up here. There's, there's nothing there at all. No air, no nothing, no mercury. It's just empty space. So there's no pressure pushing down from air molecules, because there aren't any in this space. However, there is weight pushing down. However much this column of mercury weighs, 
That's the downward force on this column. At some point, it stops falling, and that's because there's another pressure pushing back up. Here's what that pressure is due to. The atmospheric pressure is pushing down on the surface of the bowl because the bowl is sitting on the Earth and the atmospheric pressure is pushing on the Earth. That force is transferred up and it pushes up the column. And when the upward force of the atmospheric pressure matches the weight of the column, the column stops falling. Now, if the pressure were to get a little higher, well, then it could support a taller column that would weigh more. And so he would see his column of mercury get higher when the pressure was higher. And if the pressure got lower, well, it couldn't support as much of a column, and so it would drop so that its weight was less. And then he could measure how far was it from some reference point, probably the surface of the mercury, up to the current level of the mercury in the tube. And here's what he found out. He found out that most of the time, the pressure stayed between 730 millimeters tall and about 760 millimeters. Most people live in that zone between 730 and 760 millimeters of atmospheric pressure. A new unit of pressure, a very useful unit of pressure, has been developed based on the barometer that's called an atmosphere. And one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, which is sort of an average atmospheric pressure on a barometer at sea level. If we were to measure that in inches instead of millimeters, we'd find that it was 29.9 inches. And in the U.S., that's the pressure unit that people like meteorologists use. Now let's compare the atmosphere to some other units of pressure. The SI unit of pressure was the Pascal. Here's why we don't use Pascals that often, because it takes 101,325 Pascals to add up to normal atmospheric pressure. But if you ever need to convert, you can do that. And this would also mean that there are 101.325 kilopascals, which will get used from time to time. The millimeter of mercury as a pressure unit has been renamed the Tor after Evangelista Torricelli. So if you see Tor or millimeter of mercury, it means the same thing. There's another unit of pressure that gets used from time to time, and that's called the bar. A bar is 100,000 pascals. So this is an SI-based unit. It's not based on the barometer. One bar is 100,000 pascals. Remember, there are 101,325 pascals in an atmosphere. So this is pretty close to one atmosphere, a bar, but not exactly. It turns out that there is 1.01325 bars in an atmosphere. Often millibars are used instead of bars because it's sort of the Tor equivalent in the SI system. And so 1,013.25 millibars is the same thing as an atmosphere. We won't use millibars that often. We won't use pascals that often. We will use Tors and atmospheres quite a bit. In the United States, we use a different pressure measurement than nearly everybody for lots of uh, commercial purposes, and that is the pound per square inch. So that's a pound of force on a square inch, abbreviated PSI. And 14.7 PSI is the same as an atmosphere, just for reference. Sometime you might want to measure something other than atmospheric pressure. This would probably be a fairly common thing. Well, there are a couple of very basic options that help us understand how pressure could be measured. One of them is called the open-ended manometer. A manometer is just a U-shaped tube is all it is, and the U-shaped tube has mercury in it. So if I have a manometer and I just pour some mercury in this U-shaped tube, mercury being a liquid is going to find its own level if this isn't hooked up to anything. So imagine this is disconnected right here. I would have atmospheric pressure pushing down on this side, and I would have atmospheric pressure pushing down on this side, and so the levels would be the same, same pressure on both sides. However, let's say I hook this up to a bulb that has some gas in here, and I want to measure the pressure of this gas. And then I open this valve, and the gas starts to push on this side of the column. If that pressure in that gas is bigger than atmospheric pressure, there would be this sort of reverse tug-of-war, like a push-of-war, on the mercury column, and it will win. The gas will beat the atmospheric pressure if it's larger. So now I've got this situation. The pressure of the gas is pushing down here. 
the pressure of the atmosphere is pushing down here, and I can measure a difference in pressure, and I could measure that in millimeters. That difference in pressure is how much bigger the gas pressure is than the atmospheric pressure. So if you wanted to know the pressure of the gas in this situation, it would be equal to the atmospheric pressure, which it's balancing, plus however many millimeters extra it has pushed that column up. So this is how you could use an open-end manometer to figure out the pressure of the gas. If you have a barometer and you measure the atmospheric pressure and you measure this delta P, you can just add the two together and that's the pressure of the gas. Let's say you hook this thing up to your gas bulb and you open up the valve and it turns out that the pressure of the gas is less than the atmospheric pressure. Well, in that case, this is what's going to happen with the mercury column. The atmospheric pressure pushing down on the right-hand side here is going to be greater than the pressure of the gas, and so that's going to cause a delta P, but in the different direction. Now, if I want to find the pressure of the gas here, it's whatever atmospheric pressure is minus delta P, because the pressure of the gas is that many millimeters of mercury less than the atmospheric pressure, because it lost the, the little tug of war. An open manometer has a limitation and an advantage. The advantage is easy to make. You just take a piece of glass tubing and you bend it in a U-shape and put some mercury in it. But it has a disadvantage, and that is you have a different way of calculating what the pressure is depending on if the pressure of the gas is lower or higher than atmospheric pressure. There's another tool that, that's harder to make but easier to use, and that's called the closed-end manometer. The closed-end manometer, you have a, a closed U-shaped tube. It's closed off on this end, which is kind of what the name implies. And so that means when you have a mercury column in here, there's only one side of the mercury column that adds any pressure on it at all, and that's the left-hand side, the side that's hooked up to the gas. So the pressure of the gas is here, but up here the pressure is equal to zero because there's nothing in there. That was originally completely filled with mercury like a barometer, and then it just sunk down and made a, a vacuum. So if I measure delta P here in millimeters of mercury, that delta P is the pressure of the gas. So I don't have to do any arithmetic to figure out the pressure of my gas, but I do have the trouble of making a closed end manometer, which isn't easy to do. <clears throat> well, both of those are actually fairly um, unwieldy and kind of ancient tools at this point. Most of the time we measure pressure with other kinds of tools. This is a sort of a schematic for one type of pressure measuring gauge that's in common use. <clears throat> what you can do is have a, a rigid shell, and that's shown here. This could be just like a, a can with thick walls so that it's not flexible. And then the can has some gas in it at some reference pressure. So maybe you'd put some nitrogen in there or something like that, something unreactive, and you just weld the, weld the thing shut. And you weld over the top of it a thin, flexible diaphragm, so something that can flex. So this would be made of a thin metal that can stretch a little bit one way or the other. Now, if the atmospheric pressure on the outside happens to be exactly the same as the reference pre pressure that was welded in there, then this diaphragm is just going to be flat. It's not going to go anywhere. The diaphragm could be hooked to a mechanical linkage, and that could be hooked to an arrow that's on a pivot. And you could maybe then calibrate this and say that is zero, or one atmosphere, or whatever reference number you want to choose. Now say the atmospheric pressure drops. If the atmospheric pressure on the outside is lower than the reference pressure that's welded into the can, the reference pressure is going to push this diaphragm out. If that happens, it's going to push this linkage over. The bottom half of the arrow gets pushed to the right, so the top half of the arrow, because it's putting new pressure, which is lower than the reference pressure. If the atmospheric pressure happens to increase and it becomes bigger than the reference pressure, well, that's going to push the diaphragm in, as you can see here. That pulls the linkage over to the left, which causes the arrow to swing over to the right and read a higher pressure on your scale. This is just a schematic. These things actually don't look this way. They're usually more robust and a lot more compact. And nowadays, instead of a mechanical linkage, there's often going to be something called a strain gauge. It's a little electronic device that's just glued to that diaphragm. And when the diaphragm stretches, it measures that it's stretched electronically. And then another electronic device can tell if it's been stretched out or stretched in, and that just gets electronically converted, and a little display reads out what's the pressure. You can make these things very small, almost to the point where you have to weld them under a microscope, and then you can put lots of little pressure gauges all over the place on airplane wings or uh, 
inside a little watch that has a pressure gauge on it or any place where you need to measure pressure a lot. Here's a good old-fashioned tire gauge uh, that you use to check your tires, and this measures something called gauge pressure. Basically, a tire gauge, if you cut it apart, you don't see very many parts in there. There's a little piston that's sort of sealed in there, and then there's this rod. And on both sides of the rod, when it's not hooked up to the tire, you're going to have the same pressure. You're just going to have the atmospheric pressure. When you hook it up to your tire, the atmospheric pressure is still there, but then you're also going to have the pressure that's exerted by whatever air is in the tire. That pressure is going to be bigger than just the atmospheric pressure because now the two are added together, and that's going to cause this rod to get shoved out. And then this has markings on there, and however far it gets shoved out, well, that's a measurement of how much bigger the pressure is inside the tire than it is outside. So if you check your tires with a tire gauge, and it tells you that you, know, you have 32 PSI of pressure in your tire, that's really not the pressure in your tire. That's how much higher the pressure in your tire is than the pressure outside. But that's okay, because all of your manufacturer's recommendations and everything are based on gauge pressure. In our next video, we're going to use pressure together with volume, temperature, and quantity, or number of moles, to try and develop some relationships that help us understand how pressure relates to those quantities.